I'll be speaking about Goat Game Holohorn Rumination, uh, which is a hyperlink based game that I made, which is about um, the psychological toll of navigating ethical questions within an institution. And you might remember it if you were watching IFCOP last fall, but Goat Game was my senior degree project when I was an undergrad at RISD. And this talk is adapted from my thesis paper, which I'll link to at the end of my talk. So what I want to share today are the ideas of affective storytelling and ethical art making, which are two terms that I made up uh, to broadly describe the two major principles that sort of guided my creative process. <clears throat> so some background info. Um, as, as Justin said, I am a graphic designer currently working in children's book publishing. Um, and I started this project when I was taking a class about trauma and art history, um, but I was in school for illustration and literary arts and studies. So although I've been interested in game design and ethics and trauma for a long time, um, I'm not an expert. <laughs> uh, my area of expertise is visual communication, which means making pictures and pairing them with words and other pictures strategically to make my audience think and feel a certain way. Um, second, I feel as an artist that it's not really my place ever to tell an artist, another artist what to do. Um, there's a lot of art that is completely antithetical to what I'm about to say and also equally valid in its own way. Um, the strategies in this presentation were developed for like an audience first approach. So attempting to like validate the experience of readers who have gone through something difficult or traumatic. So I hope that is the main context in which these ideas will be applied. So here's a very brief summary of Goat Game. Basically, you are an entry level researcher at this biotech company in a world where everyone happens to be a goat. Um, it is revealed through a public scandal that there is some shady stuff going on. And the game is about how you and the people around you react um, and the impact that has on your relationships and morale. Um, this game is inspired by an event that happened to me and a group of coworkers, um, and I made this game sort of as a way to help us process what happened. So as you can see in this screenshot of the gameplay and of my twine map, um, this is sort of the structure and mechanics. Um, so you navigate the game by clicking on the purple links and it takes you through a pretty linear story um, and you make choices at several points throughout the story, which distribute points to the three categories at the bottom of the screen, work, social and opportunity, um, which represents your affinity with your company, with public opinion and with your immediate material interests. Um, also, the point, depending, so depending on your point distribution, at the end of the game, you'll be taken to one of the 14 endings in the row at the bottom um, and the row of asterisks on the screen next to the categories um, that is like a tracker to tell you how many of the endings you found. <clears throat> so the event that Goat Game is based on, it happened while I was working a summer job and afterwards I return to school like all worked up about it because like it kind of messed me up and I wanted to make something about it but I didn't know how to start and I happened to have already pre-registered in my, myself in to be in this class art and trauma uh, which kind of ended up being the perfect framework to help me tackle the themes I was thinking about so these are some of the texts we read for that class unclaimed experience by Kathy Carruth regarding the pain of others by Susan Sontag and Empathic Vision by Jill Bennett. And those are the book covers because I find those helpful for me to remember. So the key takeaway I got from Caruth was um, trauma is um, deeply individual and kind of a cyclical process that a person goes through and also inherently unknown to some degree um, because trauma is like an experience that is not successfully assimilated into your memory. So you can't really treat it as you would a typical topic. Um, so understanding and communicating 
a traumatic experience then can only happen with like humility and also an acceptance of ambiguity and uncertainty. Um, Sontag writes about the misconception people had that war photography would move people to work towards world peace, which obviously has not happened. And one of her main points is that when you expose people to like images of other people suffering, that is one like harmful for people who have like experienced something like that. Um, and two can backfire on spectators by making them desensitized rather than empathetic, especially because they're sort of like a lack of, I guess, a lack of like action that a viewer can take. Um, so sort of in response to this, Bennett writes, like, focus on the affect of the piece, the emotional core in an, when you're looking at an art piece, like what actually works in creating empathy between the subject and the viewer. Um, and she suggests that using narrative is more powerful than simply depicting like what happened. So here are the principles that I formulated for myself. So affective storytelling, um, I define as establishing empathy for the subject by recreating their emotional experience instead of taking advantage of the topic's shock value. And ethical art making, I define as prioritizing support and healing for contributors and viewers during the creative process. So the first is about creative choices, and the second is about interpersonal choices, which I believe have to go hand in hand. Um, if you're working from life experience or especially the experiences of other people, which is what I wanted to do, um, you have to establish that trust and care first, which I think in itself can be pretty transformative. So when I started this project, like in earnest, uh, the first thing I did was set up interviews with all of the coworkers that was in my group to hear their opinions on the event and gather inspiration to like hear what they thought my project should do because I wanted to you know incorporate their experience as much as possible even though it was going to be just me making it so when I spoke with them like two themes sort of emerged both like from what they were saying to me and also from what I was realizing in myself so first is it's really validating just to talk with people who like understand something that you've been going through um and i noticed that the like those of those of the co-workers who had a strong social circle to turn to tended to have a more optimistic outlook um, the second thing is that when i saw all my friends like different rationales for their reactions to the event it made me realize it was much less important like whether I was having the correct response as an individual and more important whether I was thinking about how the systemic issues at hand needed to be addressed. So these revelations were something that I really wanted to integrate into the playing experience. So here are briefly um, a list of games which I learned from when I was trying to make code game. And I won't go too much into detail about these individually, but I'll sort of bring up points as I talk about my strategies. But I think all of these games are like just, just good, good games in themselves. Um, but basically, they all talk about trauma in one form or another. And I think they are successful at telling a like psychologically compelling, but also morally nuanced story through gameplay, writing, or both. And here's a visual of them. Okay, so now how did I go about making Goat Game? So I'm gonna go through like a couple of, I guess, thematic through lines in my process. And the first is privacy and emotional distance. So a lot of people when they play the game will be like, so why are they goats? And I don't really explain that in game. I have like personal narrative reasons for that, but like the simple answer is it made it easier for me to write about what happened if they weren't humans. Um, but I also wanted to create a sense of distance 
from the reality of the event. Like one, to protect my friend's privacy because consent is important. And also to prevent players from identifying too closely with the protagonist. So because trauma is complex and not always explainable, I want players to experience and also accept a disconnect from the protagonist's thoughts and choices. Um, so this is done through, if you see on the right, you know, there's like a, there's like a in-game image of the protagonist sort of looking away out the window. And I deliberately wanted like, like you don't really know what that person is thinking really, even though all of the story is like happening in front of you. So, you know, depicting the protagonist always in third person, um, having a really sparse inner monologue and just writing in just such a way that is trying to do like showing and not telling. In all of the games that I was referencing, I think there is not much introspection or moral judgment provided by the game itself, but it gives you like little pieces of feedback and information through like accumulated information or interactions, which then like are sort of prompting the player to do that introspection for themselves. So I was hopefully like was similarly hoping to use subtle cues to prompt the player in that way. Um, the second theme is cycles and repetition. So when you go through something traumatic and you're not able to integrate that experience like you would a normal memory, I think there's a tendency to revisit it again and again, which is sort of like an unconscious reenactment attempting to make sense of the memory. And I actually think that phenomenon is very similar to the idea of like trying to find the best ending in a game. So all of the, and all of the, and all of the games that I was inspired by also have a very cyclical structure, whether it's on an action by action basis or on running on cycles, days or weeks. Um, so in Goat Game, it was a very deliberate choice to have every ending feel like, oh, this isn't satisfying, like this doesn't add up. Let me try again, see if I can do better this time. Um, and the word rumination in the title of the game is a reference to that. Um, I also wanted the main choices in the game to mirror this by being quite repetitive. Um, and as as you're progressing through the story, the stakes and the information that you have access to is changing. But each time you're essentially answering the same question, like where does your loyalty lie? When it's your family asking, when it's your coworkers asking, when it's a journalist asking, and then finally um, at the end, you decide like whether you are leaving or staying at your work. And that's when you actually decide what you want your life to look like. Uh, third is a flattened moral scale. So Goat Game has a bunch of endings. And I think when you encounter games like this, it's pretty common to expect various degrees of like success and morality or like ending up with different love interests or whatever. And I love how endings are constructed in, in the YOG, where sometimes you'll get endings that are like totally nonsensical and unrelated to like anything you did during the game, um, which is not always satisfying, but I find it really like realistic and kind of subversive. Um, or in this war of mine, where you're trying to survive a war, um, at the end, each player gets or each player character gets an ending, but their future quality of life and mental health has like a very close relationship with how you treated others during the war. So if you if you like are like you're like, oh no, we're like low on resources, I'm gonna steal from this old lady, then you know, maybe you have a less optimistic outlook afterwards. So a key takeaway I wanted players to have was their choices are not determining a moral score, but rather a set of priorities with unique consequences and trade-offs. So I have two sort of ending profiles here on the screen. Um, and one of them is not more satisfying than the other. So the workaholic goat who invests all their points into work and stays at the lab, you know, they may achieve a lot of success in their career, but sacrifice some of their relationships with people who were more socially minded. 
Um, conversely, in this other profile, you've like put one point into every category and maybe you understand the situation with a lot of nuance, but you may feel like more paralyzed and like not able to take meaningful action. I really love in Signs of the Sojourner how secondary characters are used. There's a system where like different characters are associated with different symbols representing different personalities. Um, and because the protagonist has like zero or very little dialogue in game, the people that you end up aligning your like card deck with, so it's a card deck of symbols, the people that you end up aligning your protagonist with has much like says a lot about who you are as a character. So I did this also in Go Game where I'll say this person is all work, this one is all opportunity, this one's like a centrist. Um, and I'll write scenes where other characters are more sympathetic or more hostile to you, depending on your values, uh, how, how your values are lining up. And the last one is structuralism and collective healing. So the last reason all of the endings are slightly unsatisfying is I believe it's very difficult for individuals to overcome institutional problems. Um, however, like each version of the protagonist, depending on where they end up, gains like some insight into an aspect of the system, which is still valuable. So in, in the game, spoilers, after you find the, um, all of the endings, there's a secret ending afterwards where all of the versions of the protagonist meet in a dream sequence and they acknowledge each other's strengths and sort of commit to changing the system together. And this is meant to serve as an invitation to the player to think not in terms of making right or wrong decisions, but rather to work with people with similar ideals and consider what they can offer to a collective effort. So when I uh, entered Goat Game into IF Cup, I got a lot of interesting reviews. Um, it did pretty well, I think, considering everything. And the reviews were really helpful for me to see like the strengths and weaknesses of my approach. So strengths are nuance. Um, when you have space to explore multiple points of view with not a lot of moral judgment, um, it makes it possible to have lots of room for nuance. And like I noticed that even reviewers who didn't particularly like the game would point that out, that, that subtlety was there. Um, second, most importantly, is impact on an intended audience. I think the best way to know whether this kind of project is working is to test it on the people that it was created for. Uh, I'm quite proud to say that the in interviewees like the friends of mine who played the final version of Goat Game, they either identified positively, positively with the story or thought that it helped them make more sense of the event that it was based on. I think the best review I got during IFCOM was from a stranger who was like, I like just went through something like this too. And like, this is so relatable and it really hits home, but like, found also that the process of discovering the different endings made the story a more enjoyable experience. Uh, weaknesses are entertainment value. So the reality of making a game that asks you to replay it multiple times to achieve uniformly unsatisfying endings is if you don't maintain the interest of players, they'll get bored before they see what the story is really about. Um, and of course, I relied very heavily on the visuals and the world building in order to compensate for this. Um, but if I had been like a more experienced programmer or writer, I probably would have wanted to build more narrative variation inside the central storyline. And directness and clarity. So when you prioritize affect, like the emotional effects of the story on people, um, that means usually that your storytelling will be more roundabout. Um, so several players who reviewed my game expressed disappointment because I set them up to expect a different playing experience than what they got. So it requires a lot of setup on your part to lead 
players to the themes and ideas that you're aiming for. So definitely not easy to pull off, but very worth it when it does work out. So before I want to close, I want to say thank you to Liz Maynard, who was the professor of my art and trauma class, for providing the space and resources I needed to embark on this project with the thoughtfulness it deserved. Uh, Rachel Dietkis, who is a social worker and designer, she hosted a wonderful workshop on trauma-informed design that I was at earlier this month. There's going to be a, a, a link to a paper um, about like best practices when interviewing people for like trauma informed design. Uh, and her presentations also just inspired me when I was preparing for this. Um, I'm grateful to Fred Lynch and Taylor Polites, my degree project supervisors, who supported me as I went from making this idea of a game into an actual playable game. I want to thank my dad, Paul, who introduced me to interactive fiction like 15 years ago and to everyone at PRIF for welcoming me into the community. And lastly, most special thanks to Aruna, Daniel, Harry, Ivy, and Sam for trusting me with your innermost thoughts about the event which inspired this game. Your game is first and foremost made for and dedicated to all of you. So that's all I have for the presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, so I have, for the rest of the time, uh, I have for Q&A, and that's the QR code for Goat Game. And I'm also going to copy paste some links into the chat for everyone. <laughs>